Before I start thinking about mix levels, there's a number of procedures I follow to make sure I'm completely in control of my mix environment. They soon become second nature, so it's a matter of repetition and making sure you have a defined workflow. If you're going to be collaborating with others, like a mix engineer or a remixer, it's also important to make sure your tracks are going to make sense to whoever you end up working with. Let's take a look at a few areas where workflow is crucial. Housekeeping is a good place to start. Before you start mixing, you want to make sure all of your tracks are tidied up and free of audio gremlins. Like This is the boring but essential stuff you've probably been putting off the whole time you've been in creative mode. It's a good idea, firstly, to clean up the space between events on each audio track. If you're working purely with software, instruments, and samples, this isn't going to be much of a factor. But if you're recording vocals or guitar or, you know, like anything with a mic, it will. So you can use a noise gate, but I find it's much more accurate to just dive in and delete the space manually. Like apply a short fade in and fade out to each clip as you go. Cubase has also got a feature called Detect Silence, which can speed up the process, but even then, I prefer to just do it manually. In a similar vein, you should ensure that any tails are faded out appropriately and check that nothing is holding over too long. It's not unusual to find that reverb tails or chords are lingering into the next bar, which creates a clash if the chord is changed. Small issues like that can mean that your chorus like never quite hits properly and it always sounds smushy and weird. Clicks introduced by audio editing are the other nasty you want to eliminate. Ideally, you should check for them as you edit, but if you want to be thorough, listen to each part in solo right before you mix. This is where you can manually crossfade adjoining events, but for the most part, I use Cubase's auto crossfade function, which mostly makes clicks a non-issue. Once all of that mind-numbing maintenance is out of the way, I go through and I generally consolidate all of my tracks. I'm not really comfortable if I have a project with hundreds of edits and tiny audio snippets, and my Cubase project file is the sole keeper of the information of where all of those go. So as much as practical, I like to have my track zipped up and consolidated. It gives me an extra backup. Like if I had to rebuild the track from the audio in the project folder alone, I could. Computers can crash and projects can become corrupted or accidentally deleted. So it's a nice safeguard to have. And probably more importantly, consolidating all of those little snippets cleans up your project window so you're not dealing with like so much visual information. And hey, once you've done all of that, be a super pro and back up your project, preferably to the cloud. As they always say, a song that is not backed up off-site only barely exists. Okay, only I say that, but it's good info nonetheless. CPU management is not about the system you have or your processor clock speed. It's more about how you maximize what you get out of your processor. Now, before you start to mix, Firstly, remove the plugins you're not using. Even though they're inactive, they may be sitting there asking your CPU for stuff. Because I always start with a giant template with tons of plugins preloaded, I can just remove what I don't end up using and free up resources. Now, just a quick note on that. My approach is start with everything I'll ever need to use and delete what I don't use at the end. Because I keep most of my instruments disabled, I can have literally dozens of processor-hungry synths loaded and ready to be pressed into service without my CPU complaining. Like, once the arrangement is firmed up and I'm about to mix, I'll render the instruments I've used and disable them again. By disabling rather than just muting them, I get that CPU power back, which I might need for more mix plugins. If I want to reload the instrument and re-render at a later point, it's still sitting there and easily accessible. Now, if you really want to let your CPU run wild during the mix, you can switch your audio device to a higher latency. Higher latencies are not really practical for tracking, especially if you're using software instruments, but for straight mixing, I find that a latency of anything up to 1024 is fine. You'll notice a little sluggishness with the stop and play buttons, but it's a small price to pay for all of that juicy processing power. 
And as far as your CPU is concerned, the difference between a 128 and a 1024 latency is huge. So don't be afraid to constantly switch your latency depending on which part of the process you're up to. Let's move on to the best way to organize your session. So first up, I recommend moving unused and muted tracks like right out of the project. I stick everything that didn't make it into the final song into a folder I just call unused. After muting each audio event with the mute tool, not the mute button, I disable each track. Stop it dead in its tracks before it accidentally becomes unmuted and somehow becomes part of the song again. Like, Don't just rely on the mute button, mute the actual events, you'll see them grayed out, and disable the entire track. You're also freeing up any CPU resources that they're hogging unnecessarily. Then your folder of unused material can sit somewhere at the top or the bottom of your project window and just never be thought of again. I mean, you could delete the whole lot, but my philosophy is why delete when you can just disable and folder it away somewhere? I guess I'm an audio hoarder in that sense, but that approach has saved me more than once when someone asked, what was that low harmony we tried and decided against? It's also a great idea to make sure that everything's named clearly. Like more than anything, you want to be able to find the tracks easily, both now and in the future, because maybe in a few years, you might want to return to the song and remix it. Like, and future you will be glad that present day you took the time to be organized. And I've got some old, old projects where I want to kick myself for leaving tracks with names like Audio-34. And if you're thinking about passing it along to someone else to mix or you know, co-produce, it should be easy to follow and clear. I also suggest a system of color coding for your tracks, you know, and stick to it consistently. For example, in my projects, a kick drum's always dark green and a snare drum's always red, bass part's yellow, you know, so on. So, you know, you'll run out of colors eventually, but if the main common elements are always colored in a similar way, it just makes them that much easier to find. And for me, like anything that speeds up my workflow is gonna give my brain more time to be creative. And in the end, the best music's gonna win, not the best organization. But if you're scrambling around, looking for tracks, wondering where that weird sound is coming from and generally having like a schmozzle of a project window, it slows you down and interrupts all of the fun. And you know what? You really need to use folder tracks if you're not using it already. This is one feature of Cubase that I think is really ingenious and it's underused by most people. I like to keep all of my drums in one folder, all of my transition effects in another, all of my synths in another, and so on. It, it's gonna declutter your view, and when you get into larger and larger projects, it's gonna cut down on the time you spend scrolling through 100 tracks to find out where that out-of-tune backing vocal is. One of my own special Cubase hacks is that I like to have an arrangement track always visible in the top pane. I've got my own particular way of doing it. It's just a blank MIDI track with color-coded blocks. Like for me, red is verse, blue is chorus, etc. Now other folks like to use the built-in arrangement track, which I think is fine for this purpose as well, but I just like my big blocks of color. I can really quickly navigate to the section I wanna work on. Like you don't wanna be wasting time trying to find out where the first verse starts, especially if you're working with an artist and you're on the clock. A few other quick tips to help you get your sessions organized. Firstly, I always make sure I have like a minute of silence before the song begins. In other words, every song I work with starts at one minute on the timeline. The idea is that if I want to extend the intro or add something extra to the beginning, like an ambient effect, I don't need to move the whole project. I also like to set a definite start and end point for the song, and I'm always gonna use that as a guide when I'm exporting it. So my start point is normally a 16th note ahead of the first event, just to give the song that extra dead space before you hit play. So this comes from the days when DAWs would do odd things when you'd start your bounce right on a transient, but also from media players or streaming services that might not react fast enough to catch that initial moment. I think it's probably half superstition these days, but it's force of habit and I always leave that dead air up the top. I also find it handy to have a definite endpoint so all tracks fade out by that marker. 
I usually do a global fade on the master bus. I mean, I'm not talking about a fade out. I haven't done one of those <laughs> since the 90s. I mean the very last note of the song or the reverb tail or the last hit. These clear start and end points mean every time I pull up the song, I know exactly where my locator should be set when I'm bouncing and the song length never changes. If you're really going to get the best out of your mix, you need to get your gain staging right. Now, I know it seems like a boring and nerdy audio engineering topic, but it's something that the pros always do and the beginners have never even heard of. And to be honest, there's not really even that much to it. The essence of gain staging is that you want your combined tracks to hit the master bus close to zero dB, but not over. That is loud enough so you're extracting the optimal resolution from your files and the audio engine, but not so loud that you're introducing distortion. Now, it's a tricky thing to manage because as you add more and more parts, the level's gonna increase. So how do you predict how loud it's all gonna be once everything is there? Okay, so here's a tip that gets me out of trouble. I load every project with a reference kick drum. Now, it's almost definitely not gonna be the kick drum that I'll ultimately use, but it gives me a level reference for where a kick, like any kick, is ultimately gonna sit in a mix that has proper gain staging. I'll explain that a little more. Like, let's say the first thing I wanna record is a piano. Without a reference, I've got no real idea where to set the level of that piano. Like, I've got a basic idea, but for proper gain staging, I wanna be more accurate than that. If the piano is too loud from the outset, then the drums are gonna be too loud, and then the vocal will need to be too loud, and every track that comes after that is going to be too loud. Now, that means I'm gonna quickly run out of headroom. I might need my lead vocal set at plus 6 dB just to be heard, and once you're up there, there's nowhere to go but down. The combined output of all of the tracks in my project is gonna clip the master bus, introducing distortion. And that means I'm gonna to need to go back and turn down each track individually. In the process, I'm gonna lose the relative balance I've been setting up and basically have to remix the entire song. I prefer to compare the level of the first track I record or import to my preloaded kick drum. Then I have a frame of reference for where that piano, for example, should sit level-wise. I already know that if I continue to build on the gain staging framework with the kick as the initial level reference, no matter what I add on top, assuming it's mixed well, I'll be hitting my master bus in the sweet spot. And for me, that's just under zero dB. No peaks, but making use of the full resolution of the system. Whether your first track is a piano or a drum loop, a bass line or the kick itself, it's a pretty simple matter to balance the rest of the elements around that. Like you're really going to get it exactly right, but as long as the first thing you lay down is in the ballpark and you don't radically change its level later on, your gain staging will mostly take care of itself. I tend to sleep well at night if a song has one dB of headroom in the loudest parts. Related to that, you want all of your faders in the sweet spot. I don't follow this religiously, but for me, if most of my faders are initially somewhere between minus nine and minus three dB, I'm pretty happy. So why is that important? Well, for one thing, if you already have a track set to its maximum output, there's nowhere else to go. I rarely have a fader creep over the zero dB mark. You wanna leave headroom so that if the track needs to go up, there's plenty of blue sky above its initial position. And likewise, if you have a channel sitting at minus 24 dB, the resolution of that fader is greatly reduced. Like, think about it. Every micro move that you make could actually double or halve the volume of that channel. My advice is to clip gain each event as you go so each fader can sit in that nice meaty minus nine to minus three dB zone. You've still got plenty of room to turn the sound way up or way down um, or make very specific tiny level moves that have a subtle rather than drastic effect. You likely need to bring the level of most samples that you import down because they're gonna be normalized and maxed out. So. Almost always, if I'm importing a cymbal or impact or riser, I'm gonna clip gain it down by six or 12 dB. Then my fader can sit in that sweet spot. And if I need the cymbal a smidge louder or a touch quieter, I'm good. Lastly, let's talk about referencing. That is checking what you're doing against commercially released tracks that already sound like the business. 
I start each mix session by listening to some really great mixes in the same genre. Ideally, you want to get CD rips, but even something recorded direct from a streaming site, assuming you're listening to the highest quality they offer, works pretty much well enough for me these days. By playing some top-notch music in the style that you're working on, on your speakers, in your room, you can really start to tune in on what you need to achieve if you're going to be competitive. So sometimes that can be depressing and even discouraging to just, you know, hear how great theirs is and how much further yours has to go. But that's how we all get better. Always try to level match the output of your mix to the reference tracks, you know, because louder always sounds more exciting and you don't want to be distracted by that. If you're going to be mastering the track as well, you'll be concerned with the actual output level. But for the purposes of mixing, you'll normally need to just turn the reference down a bit. You'll be listening to mastered tracks that have likely been pushed to their absolute maximum volume, so bear that in mind. Even though I've been doing this for more than 20 years now, I still need to reference every day with every song. Like, yes, I know my room and I know my gear, but it's amazing how quickly your ears can get used to a mix that has got no top end or way too much bass or a horrible, annoying mid-range. Our ears can normalize poor quality sound pretty quickly, which is why I can watch a two-hour Netflix movie on a TV with awful speakers and not be super bothered. My ears quickly forget that there's meant to be a room-shaking bottom end in the action scenes. I'll watch the same movie in my studio and suddenly hear all of the intricacies of the audio. So by quickly flicking to a reference track when you're mixing, you'll immediately hear the global problems in what you're doing. So here's an admission, okay. Even at this point in my evolution as a mixer and producer, I leave most mix sessions feeling completely beaten by the reference track, you know? But like, I'm referencing massive hits with incredible sounds and impeccable mixing. So on the occasions when I feel like I'm operating in their rarefied space, it's a good day, you know? But whether I'm smashing that reference track or just barely keeping up with it, I can have the confidence to know that if my mix sounds comparable in terms of EQ and levels, it's in decent shape. And I'm not gonna have any weird surprises when I play it in my car or all things going really well, hear it on the radio. So there are some of my tips for controlling your mix. Thanks for watching it. If you've got any workflow suggestions, leave them in the comments below and let's start a conversation. Uh, also subscribe to the Cubase channel for plenty more videos just like this.